The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anuj Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping shape it. Hope you're all well. This is just a quick note to mention again that I'll be attending CB Expo in Zurich in Switzerland on April 14th, so in a couple of weeks' time. It's a great event with a wide variety of speakers. I'll be giving a little recap on 150 episodes of the Cannabis Conversation. Switzerland's a really interesting country, actually, for cannabis, as it has some of the more liberal laws in relation to cannabis in Europe. There will be lots of the great and good from the European industry there, so please do join us. I'll be posting links to tickets on my LinkedIn page. I'm also keen to meet up. So if you'd like to have a meeting and chat, please do drop me a line and hopefully we can fix something up. Now, on with the show. Enjoy. On today's show, I have Paul North and Katia Kowalski. They are both from VaultFast, which is the leading UK drug policy think tank. Guys, welcome. How are you doing today? Good. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having us on. That was a very calm intro. I liked it. You've set me, you put <laughs> me in a calm headspace, which is probably what you need to have me on this sort of thing. Yeah, I had lots of CBD <laughs> before I started the show. So, uh, <laughs> I've heard it helps. Yeah, th- so have I. <laughs> Welcome back, Paul, by the way. Are you one of my early, early guests? I think we recorded it at Cannabis Europa about 400 years ago. Yeah, so. was it, yeah I remember that actually, in like a sweaty little booth thing. I think you had bigger hair back then. I don't know. I had horrendous hair back then. I saw a picture of it the other day and I, and I was like, why didn't it? It was like touching and cur- and like bending on the shoulders. I was like, why did no one tell me that? I had like friends at the time. It was why did you? Of... <laughs> we hadn't become friends by that stage. It was like an early 80s Liverpool footballer style, I think. But uh, Katia, thank you for joining us as well. So listen, we've got loads to talk about here. You guys have been in the news a lot recently. So we'll get onto that juicy stuff in a minute. But we usually start with a bit of a personal intro for you both. So Katia, would you like to kick off and just give us a bit of background and how and why you got into this space? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me on. So yeah, I've been working at VaultFast for a year and a half almost. It's really flown by, but I've got a background in psychology. So kind of my position at VaultFast is kind of my first big girl job, I guess, as you'd have it. So yeah, I finished my master's mid-2020 and I got into the drug policy space really through an interest in addiction and the kind of link between drug use and mental health problems and the kind of, I guess, the conflation and lack of kind of understanding of how those things are linked. So yeah, kind of initially what got me interested, I I was assigned an essay topic on what comes first, the drug use or the mental illness. So I looked at cannabis use and psychosis and after finishing the essay, I really realized there's a lot of stuff we still don't understand. And that kind of led me down a path to being interested in drug policy. And yeah, and here I am today. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And where are you from originally, if you don't mind asking? I'm half Czech, half American, but I've kind of spent quite a lot of time in, in the UK. I was born in the UK and been here for the last kind of six years or so. So yeah, my accent confuses a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and then what's your reflection on how things are going in, in the States? In the States, I mean, yeah, they're going, I think they're going really well. I mean, when I started at Vault Fast, that was kind of the month of the US election and we saw like five states go legal. So yeah, it's really, it's really taken off there. And I think you're, we'll see, I mean, we're already seeing a progression in Europe with, you know, stuff in, in Germany and Malta, Switzerland and Luxembourg. So it is slowly coming over, but I think the kind of approach in the US is just it's very different to the UK. So I think it's a lot easier with the kind of ballot system to get things through and to see change very much from like the grassroots bottom up. And the dollar dollar bill, y'all, signs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, Sorry, that definitely bad hip hop reference there. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lovely hip hop reference. Great. Thank you, Katia. Paul, do you want to give it a go? Yeah, cheers, mate. So my background in criminology and drug treatment, worked for drug treatment services for nine years, did a whole host of roles that you can imagine that take place in such services and for six of those years, ended up being a manager running adult services and young people services. Got sick of people dying, got sick of seeing the devastation that was being caused to vulnerable communities and populations. So thought, well, I've done this for nine years, let's do something different. Applied to, to cut a long story short, ended up approaching and speaking to VaultFast. And they were like, well, don't be a lecturer or an academic, just come work straight at the front line of 
policy reform come up with VaultFast. So I did that. I've been doing that for five years now and I've seen VaultFast go through a number of different evolutions and iterations. I think that's what I like about it. It's always changed as the environment around it changes rather than just doing the same thing over and over again and, and getting stuck. So I've managed it through a couple of those iterations. I've been a director for three no, two and a half years, I think I've been a director. And now I'm the sole director and owner of the company. But it's been fun. It's a fun journey. And I, even I think back to when we, yeah, it was ages ago when it was a cannabis Europa. Like even then, like so much has changed globally and within Vault Fast and just within the industry and stuff. So yeah, even though I've been doing it for like five years, it does feel like a long time. Yeah, no, I can imagine. I mean, you know, obviously when I got into it, it sort of ended 2017, 2018, and there has, well, Initially, there were quite a lot of stuff going on and probably at your level there is, you know, we were talking about it off air before, but the industry has been a bit too slow, I think, on a wider kind of commercial level. But I guess where you're at is probably a bit more interesting. Yeah, I guess we see like a broad picture of it. I think when in 2018, so when last time we spoke, it had been after the Cold War campaign. So that was like 2018. I mean, I, I kind of maybe assume that not everybody knows loads about VaultFast. So like we were the campaign group, the organization that ran that campaign and obviously like played... There was lots of really great stuff going on. Hannah Deke was doing an amazing campaign, loads of great advocacy work. There's, there's numerous, it would be completely foolish to think it was only us. There was loads of people pushing those boundaries and creating those conversations. But we no doubt played a key role in it in 2018. And I think before then, like the, we just didn't really see anybody. Do you know what I mean? Like, and then Cannabis Europe, you know, then it happened, there was Cannabis Europa and it just emerged, didn't it? This industry just like push, flourished and all these people from North America came over and there was, that wave carried a lot of momentum. But I think there's, to reference your point, I think there's been two things. I think COVID was a challenge. Everybody, every industry, everything just shut down. And I think the overinflation of the Canadian market in particular, we felt quite strongly over here because a lot of those initial engagements in our world, in the industry world, were Canadian companies and they had budgets galore. Whereas when they had to start releasing <laughs> figures, and that's interesting as well, because, you know, we went over to Canada, we took a film crew over, we did a documentary to MPs and stuff and like, you know, it was exciting. It was really exciting experience and it looked amazing, but their perceptions around how much of the market they were going to capture versus what they actually captured, there's just a massive disparity. I mean, we we saw talks from Health Canada, their policy makes in Health Canada, they were like, you know, we're going to get like 80% of the market, 90% of the market, and then we'll gradually get to 100. It was like 50 at best at the time we were over there. Do you know what I mean? So I think that's interesting and there's an interesting discussion around, I'm saying interesting, like, ah, there's an interesting discussion around how that, that knock-on effect has, you know, been felt around the globe because the Canadians were at the forefront. Come on, let's go. Let's, you know, come on Europe. Let's go recreational. Let's go all the way. Let's have medical markets everywhere. And then it was like, yeah, yeah, let's do it guys. And then like, oh, where have you gone? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Yeah. You're, <laughs> yeah, you're back in Canada. Yeah. Uh, slight overinflation, guys. Hype. Maybe don't do that. Hype, hype. <laughs> Yeah, hype, hype and public markets, I think, is probably a big part of that. But that's a topic for another day. We did talk a bit more about what you guys do at VaultFest. But before we kind of get onto the sort of specifics of what's happening at the moment, could you describe broadly what VaultFest is all about? So I think VaultFest has changed every couple of years as the environment around it changes. But fundamentally, what VaultFest is about is bringing new voices to the debate and moving the conversation forward with key influencers and policymakers. So our ambition as an organisation is to get the UK in a place where our drug policies are less, har less harmful. Essentially, what that means is we want to see the liberalisation of cannabis. We're very happy with the current medical model. We think it needs to expand and there's some work that can be done there, but we see that as a positive progression. We think that an adult use recreational market, the evidence of that is strong and policymakers should be engaged in the benefits of that discussion. So we are very interested and invested in cannabis. We're also interested in other areas of drug reform, like drug consumption rooms diversion schemes, heroin-assisted treatment, adequate funding for vulnerable groups in drug treatment services, you know, recreational drug use at festivals and redu reducing drug-related harm there through drug testing. So there's a whole manner of things that we're interested in and we comment on, but our main stream of work sits around how can we help advance the cannabis debate in the UK? What can we do? So there's a number of different ways in which we do that. We'll do things like, we'll, we'll come on to talk about the work that we've done with the Mayor of London with a diversion scheme you know, we'll write reports and do policy and put them to government, put them to policymakers. But we also do a lot of work with the media as well. So we'll speak to the media on a regular basis, helping them navigate the complexity of the space. Because that's one of the biggest challenges that we have is that 
the media are so fundamental and crucial if you want to achieve reform in the UK. The, the relationship between the media, government and society is a very complex one. And the media plays such a fundamental role that if you don't if you don't stand alongside them and help them navigate it, you're probably going to get extremities of opinion. And that's not really good for, for policymakers. And, and the philosophical, I guess, like ideological approach of Voltfast is to try and occupy space that doesn't just sit on the left or sit on the right. Bring new people into the conversation. Don't have judgments over, the, over their positions. Don't just tell them that they're wrong. Instead, try and bring them on a journey. Because the purpose and reason we came about as an organisation is a recognition that the debate is so far skewed over to the left that it becomes very difficult to effectively achieve reform and or certainly reform that creates sensible established markets rather than you know yeah it gets to it became quite stagnant i think and obviously drug policy is naturally quite a left wing issue due to that kind of whole care harm principle but yeah if we want to see change it needs to be it needs to be kind of cross party and you need to engage everyone across the political spectrum but that just means kind of reframing it and reshuffling it and bringing in like you said Paul those kind of new new ideas new voices and new frames that engage people that you know traditionally may not care or think about drug policy that much you've got to make it a right wing issue if it, if it's not a right wing issue it's not going to happen and even someone could say oh well you just get a left wing government in and make it a left wing issue you must realize that that won't lead to sensible regulation you know just look at this look at new zealand new zealand's a great example and response to someone who says cannabis reform's a left wing issue well how did that work out in new zealand didn't work out, work out particularly well because it was pitched as a left wing issue and anybody who understands drug policy and markets and, and the economy looked at the new zealand proposition and was like well that's a bit naff it's not great i mean that's not amazing yeah you can grow your own that's good that but that should, i mean that should just be that should be a given but there was no yeah. no it's consideration a, of a sensible market. And like people forget about consumers in those sort of models. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's an interdisciplinary issue as well. Like you, I think there's people say that the kind of cannabis debate is either, you know, a social justice issue or a public health issue or, you know, a free market issue or idea. But I think you can put together models that incorporate all three of those things and keep people on the left happy and keep people on the right happy and everyone in between. Yeah, I think you highlight a really good point about the sort of need to be balanced in order to get sort of consensus, really. And, you know, it's particularly around the media stuff, which we'll get into a sec. And, you know, everything is reduced to clickbait, sort of simple headlines, and things get misreported, as we'll talk about in a minute when it comes to diversion especially, scheme. And, especially when it comes to drugs. <laughs> the media love that. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So you really do need to hold hands there and, and kind of, rather than sort of be combative, just sort of educate. So I take my hats off you for that. How's Voltfast set up and how's it funded and those sort of things? Different. It's changed over the years. I think a lot of people thought we used to be funded by the Illuminati back in the day. So sometimes I just answer that question really straight faced by saying, well, it was the Illuminati, but it's changed since then. <laughs> I joke. It was funded philanthropically. So, you know, basically we received philanthropic donations, mainly from Paul Birch, who news, you know, you know, well, sold Bebo for 800 million pounds. And then, or something along those marks. Sorry if I got it wrong, Paul, and you're listening, but it was a substantial amount of money. And then, you know, he kind of moved into the space and thought, why is it mad that people can drink alcohol but not consume cannabis? So he funded Transform a little bit, gave money to Transform, and he set up Vault Fast. So we went with that model for a bit to 2018. 2018 came along, an industry appears out of nowhere, lots of money, lots of ambition, you know, lots of energy. And I think I've always felt, we haven't got time to debate this bit at length, but like I've always felt that, what really matters to me is what you're saying and what the outcome is. That's the most important thing of anyone's position. I don't really bothered how someone got there. I don't care how someone's educated. I don't care about the background. I don't care like, you know, I just want to know what, where you are. What's your view? What's your opinion? What's your basis for that opinion? It's always been my view. But we recognize the tension that exists in engaging and taking money from the industry, particularly if you're doing advocacy. So 2018, Liz and I, an old director, we were like, let's do it. You know what I mean, let's engage the industry. Let's find a way in which we can positively engage the industry and be supported by them, but also have like a sensible boundary there by which we're not compromised and we don't just become a lobbying outfit. So we ran that model for a few years. Worked pretty well. It's quite comfortable when the Canadians were going well. COVID hits, obviously more stressful because of things that we've talked about on and off air around the Canadian market shrinking quite substantially. So again, Voltfast has gone through multiple evolutions. And the latest one is for us to just do sensible boundary commercial work that can fund and support our existing activities. So an example of that would be the diversion scheme. It would be us pitching through tenders to get get work through, I guess, like council platforms and things like that and do research and 
policy work. We also started doing media training, which is pretty cool. So we're like training different groups and organizations as to help to appear in the media. We've got tons of examples of it. We do it all the time. We're well practiced at it. And again, they're like the complexity of cannabis means that if you're going to go on the media, you don't, you can't just have standard media training because <laughs> you've got to be ready for the awkward questions. You've got to understand that the morality of the issue makes it particularly complicated. It's no longer just a simple case of like, present yourself well, be prepared, drink water before, you know, all those kind of tips. It's like, you've got, you've got to be ready for some awkward, awkward and challenging questions. So that's been cool. And there's also like some cool initiatives that we've got coming up that were, I probably can't talk about just yet, catch you or go mad. But we've got some like really cool, like patient initiatives and like research initiatives we've got coming up, which will really help the industry better understand what patients want, what society wants and how we can collectively move reform forward because I've, I've always felt that if you draw a line or have this barrier between advocacy organizations campaigning organizations and well i the guess industry, like, it creates it, more tension it creates tension yeah. and then they don't understand each other and the, the industry needs to understand all those groups all those groups underneath stand the industry if you want sensible regulated reform if you want just decrim and you want like you don't want capitalism to be a thing because it upsets you and you want to pretend we live in like some kind of utopian society that's fine can write some reports about that but it's probably not going to happen no, nothing will happen do you know what i mean you could write some cool reports but if you want to see that future i think you have to find ways of engaging the industry and that's going to stress some people out but stress people out you get cool conversations don't you yeah exactly and and you have to perfection is the enemy of progress i think so you know we have to kind of find a way to move forward but that again could be another debate let's talk a bit more about drug policy reform in the UK. And we'll, we'll get on to talk about the diversion scheme in a minute, but let's maybe start a bit wider with, with a very high level question that could take up a whole show in itself. But what are some of the current problems with drug policy in the UK? Maybe on a wider scale, but, you know, particularly relating to cannabis. Well, I guess the root problem to it now is it's not it's not evidence based. And I mean, it, me and Paul have this discussion all the time. I mean, policy in general isn't really evidence based. It's driven by morals and by ideology and what people think and what people want other people to think and what people think other people want. But yeah, I think the key route to it right now is that it's not evidence-based and is just based on this kind of moral standpoint that drug use is bad. It doesn't see drug drug use and the problems that arise with drug use as kind of an interdisciplinary, multidimensional thing. Definitely. I'd lecture a bit about this to master's students, criminology students, is like the morality, and Katja's already kind of mentioned it previously, but the morality of the issue is a huge challenge. If we were to, let's say we were doing a podcast about like some other policy area, maybe housing policy, or I don't know, environmental to some degree, maybe environmental is a middle ground. To... Yeah, it's, it's way easier. People don't yeah. have a strong moral reaction, whereas drugs. Yeah, everyone has an opinion, whether it's, you know, right or wrong or on the kind of right side of the debate or the wrong side of the debate everyone's got something to say and you know when i say oh i work in drug policy everyone's like oh and like immediately have something to say even if they know nothing about it <laughs> yeah and well i mean look there's, there's loads there but you know i mean one of the fundamental bits i guess is you know the criminalization of usage versus treating it as a kind of public health issue i mean it must be quite maddening for you that policymakers still think that a repeatedly unsuccessful policy is the way forward yeah i mean i'm reducing yeah, it to a very simple thing yeah and i mean i think that the argument that's constantly presented in the media i think there's an article in the telegraph yesterday about schizophrenia and cannabis use and you know the fact that if you use cannabis in adolescent years you're much more likely to go on to develop psychosis or schizophrenia and it's like yeah <laughs> that is true and the issue is now that you know youth access is at a, you know, an all-time high. It's way easier for kids to get access to cannabis than it is to get access to alcohol or tobacco. And it's like, yeah, we, we can agree on that. And we're trying to change that. But there's this total disconnect between the you know, idea that legalization is going to lead to the liberalization of you know, access. But you know, what, we have now is, what we have now is chaos and criminality around it. That also lacks nuance, doesn't it? Because it's this criminal infrastructure that is basically pushing it towards higher and higher THC, which definitely is a contributory factor to some of those more extreme issues. And, you know, perhaps a kind of regulated industry wouldn't have those types of products as prevalent. Yeah. And, and there's a big thing around stigma, too, because I think, you know, if you legally regulate something and something is 
legal and in that kind of legal framework, people are a lot more likely to come forward and, you know, say that they have a, a problematic relationship with a drug. Whereas now, because it's illegal, you risk criminalization, you know, there's people aren't kind of willing to kind of seek help and and talk about it. And I think, you know, having a, having an honest conversation about drug use and benefits of it and harms of it is really important. And that's what's that's definitely what's lacking at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Have you noticed any shift in policy over the years or is it I mean, the UK is not a kind of pioneer in this area, let's say. Shift just in a positive direction, just generally in in the UK, I guess. Well, just, yeah, maybe it could be in a negative direction. Who knows? But have you seen it change? I think fundamentally we have to recognise that the most right-wing, well, not even right-wing, most socially conservative prime minister we've had since Thatcher legalised medical use of cannabis. Like that that in itself is definitely a flashpoint and an interest. That's interesting and a, and a great case study. And that's a great thing to learn more about how politicians and policymakers do interact with certain groups and, and campaigns. It's a good thing to explore. I think I've seen more resistance from politicians recently because I think politicians are becoming more and more obsessed about their image and they're getting more and more stressed out about their relationship with the media and stressed out with their relationship with society. I think the cancel culture that we see broadly in society is impacting on the minds of politicians. And I think that's becoming more exacerbated as, as time goes on, not just in the UK, but globally. And I think that's a very interesting conversation. I think generally in society, there is an acknowledgement that our drug laws need to be liberalised. I think we're at a point where nearly everybody, I'd say 80%, how many people opposed the campaign was it? Like nine, the diversion scheme, 19%? Something like that. Yes. It, was like, it was like like 80% of London felt that the diversion scheme was a better idea than a bad one, right? And that's very that's very interesting. Like 80% of the biggest city in the country is good data. Yeah. And recreate, like support for recreational legalizations at an all-time high in the UK too. It's like, I think it's like 54% or something. Like the only age group that's more opposed to it than pro is 65-year-olds and plus. So like you see that there's a, there is a generational shift. Did a couple of points I would make. I would argue that the legalization of medical was exactly as you say, it was a reaction to the media. So, you know, I don't want to give them too much credit, but also <laughs> I acknowledge that's an interesting point. Do you think that London is kind of representative of the rest of the UK? Is the other no, it's, question. No, it's, it's clearly not totally representative of the rest of the UK, but it's an incredibly influential city. And if you can if you can demonstrate in the biggest city in the UK that eighty percent of people support a scheme then that's a great starting point to start exploring what other people think up and down the country. Naturally, this is the reddest city. If you look at the political map, this is the reddest city in the country. You know, there's there's a, a vast Labour presence here. It leans fairly strongly to the left. But I think even when you break down the Tory stats, so the, the YouGov polling did look at what Conservatives thought of the issue, it still more support it than are against it. Again, that's a great indication that drug policy and drug policy reform is just not as controversial as politicians think it is. Yeah, sure, you have to battle with some morality, but I think, I mean, we, we should avoid referendums, just generally, I think, from a personal perspective. I think they're just messy. I, I just don't like them on any subject. I don't think referendums are a good idea. I mean, they've all been pretty successful recently in the last they've few all gone, years. They've all gone... <laughs> depends, where it depends on who you... They've all gone so smooth around the globe. I don't know. Yeah. But I think that I think um, more, more, more of the population would certainly support decriminalisation. Whether it would go as far as supporting legalisation of drugs beyond cannabis, I'm very, very doubtful. I think if we did a national polling now on should we legalise cannabis, it would come out around the 55%. But it would be very dependent on the model and the system. And, and the left, we would lose a lot of votes, I think, to liberals who didn't want any industry involvement, i.e. would go down like a New Zealand route. So it, it would end up maybe a little bit closer. But it's, it's definitely moving. There, there's definitely progress being made. I think for me, it's about recognising that politicians are probably, this might sound unusual, but politicians probably aren't the best group to make change happen right now because they're just, they're playing their own game, the populism, the, you know, the cancel culture thing. It's all a left wing and a right wing issue. It's clashing in the middle and making a mess politically that's very hard to engage with. But if you change the system around them, they don't have much choice. Right. So the 2018 campaign is a very good example of that. The Tory party were absolutely not going to engage in medical cannabis. But if you just suddenly change the situation around them, not only about that issue, but it's an in the face demonstration that the public are ready to change and the public want change, then they move with it. So I think the, the challenge we have is to find ways to shift the environment around politicians. And to give you a, a very clear example of that, 
the best thing we could do right now collectively as an industry and as advocates is to rapidly expand the medical number of medical patients that are in the UK. That's the best hope. Don't bother lobbying politicians. Don't bother, you know, doing some pointless report. Use the system in place that's yeah. present already. Like Just expand you know. that market. Everything should be about doctor engagement, expansion of the medical market. If you're not doing those two things, you're just having a laugh. You're just enjoying yourself. I mean, you're just having fun. You're probably just enjoying what, what you're doing. But I don't think it leads to... An, you're looking far too down the line. If we did what's happened... Because if, if, if we look in Germany, if you look at the US, if you look at... Well, less so Canada, although they, in many respects, were faced with a never-ending whack-a-mole issue of dispensaries, which is similar to the, the point I'm, I'm making. You know, where reform has occurred, governments and policymakers have gone, well, we may as well legalise it. We may as well liberalise it even more because they're doing it anyway. People are getting it anyway. Do you know what I mean? So in the UK, it's about rapid expansion of the medical market, change the environment that the politicians are operating in rather than try to change the politicians. And the same thing will happen in Central Europe. Best thing that can happen to, to Europe, Germany legalises and everyone goes to Germany and gets the weed and then drives back. I mean, I'm not encouraging people to break the law because that's illegal. So I'm not, I'm not, I have to be careful, you have to be careful saying that, don't you? I don't encourage anybody to break the law. But if that were to happen, and it probably will, you know, what are they all going to say when they realise that they're losing millions of euros? every year to people going and getting cannabis and guess what it's all fine they're probably going to legalize it that's not about political lobbying that's not about like oh politicians suddenly realize that the evidence suggests to decrease harm we should legalize cannabis it's them going oh we may as well yeah making it e as easy as possible yeah yeah just yeah. make the decision yeah. for them because you can't rely on them they're too it's too much about what people think that engaging politicians is like engaging just complex i was gonna say like probably drama <laughs> do you know what i mean there's just a lot of drama there's a lot of tension there's a lot of games don't bother with them change everything around them and in many ways the 2018 you know you can say what you want about the current challenges that the medical market has or even the policy itself but it's legal and that's all it needed as soon as it went legal they opened themselves up so we've gone off topic a little bit but no, 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 no. But this is I 100% agree. I think that is the way to sort of increase a normalization of this in, in our society. And ultimately, I think there needs to be more sort of trials and evidence to convince doctors to make them more comfortable with it, which in turn, and those things take time and money. And I, that bit, I don't know whether is coming from industry enough to sort of keep yeah, up with I mean, the pace we're, we're that it needs playing to. playing catch up as well, because because the campaign in 2018 was so reactive, and it kind of just came out of nowhere and happened all of a sudden, doctors were like, wait, what's going on? <laughs> I need the evidence and everything. So I think, yeah, we're kind of playing catch up with that now. And yeah, as you said, research, evidence, medical practice, all that stuff takes takes time, understandably. As well, but, well, look, we could talk about this for ages, but let's drill down on the, the sort of your, your main project that you're working on at the moment, which is the diversion scheme in this trial scheme in London that, that's been talked about recently. Would Cassie, do you want to maybe give us an overview of what that is? Yeah, so the diversion scheme, I think, well, the media has kind of mixed it up quite a lot over the last few weeks around arguing that it's decrim or even legalization, but it's a diversion scheme that's going to be do take place in Bexley, Greenwich and Lewisham, three boroughs in London. And we'll see that um, see 25 year olds and under so young adults not be criminalized for low level possession offenses so you know have it being in possession of a couple of grams of cannabis diverting them away from the criminal justice system and put through an appropriate diversion measure so whether that be kind of just a bit of counseling family therapy drug treatment drug education basically it's a proactive approach to try and prevent reoffending and actually understand and tackle the reason why they might be in possession of drugs and yeah prevent them from kind of going through the criminal justice system and then continuing to to reoffend so that's kind of that's it in a nutshell yeah and that it sounds like a great positive scheme has this it's been trialed in other areas i assume yeah, so diversion schemes have been taking place kind of up and down the country. There, forget how many there actually are, but there's there's loads of them across the UK. So it, it's not particularly kind of a a novel thing that hasn't occurred yet. It has, but I think it's also important to mention that this is a pilot scheme. So it's not a diversion scheme that's going to be implemented widespread everywhere. It's a trial to you know see what the evidence is like, see whether it, you know it prevents reoffending and you know helps those that need it. I and mean, hopefully we see that you know then it's expanded a kind of further on. But yeah, I think evidence gathering is the, the key to it. And the evidence gathered from these other the other counties within the UK, I assume I assume that's been positive in order for the, the mayor to sort of see some merits in this. Yeah, and it's been super positive. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Paul. 
Yeah, the evidence for him is really strong. And the uh, detail is really important with a diversion scheme because a lot of people think that diversion schemes just like perpetually let people get away with things and, and they don't. I used to, I've run multiple diversion schemes when I worked in treatment from, you know, drug to alcohol. I know people get upset when you say drug and alcohol different, but whatever, you know what I mean? Drug, you know, illicit drugs and alcohol. And, you know, if people refuse to engage in diversion schemes or they just keep getting arrested, then there are alternative options. It's not like you replace it with a new criminal justice system. So, you know, essentially the way I see it is you give people a chance to do something different and to learn a little bit of information. And yeah, there's really, really, really strong evidence bases behind them for a whole number of different areas. And the police are really favorable of diversion schemes because it saves them loads of time. You know, they don't have to, they can say to people, right, you've been arrested for this. If you don't go to this appointment, we're going to charge you. So go to the appointment. You go to the appointment, cool, don't worry about it. I don't have to then spend hours with you in custody. And, you know, it's such a more efficient... Yeah, and the then they can tackle then, you know, actual violent, problematic crime. <laughs> no, completely. And I think people just don't realise that, you know, prison is the university of crime, right? So if you get put in there early, then you're kind of a very high likelihood that you'll spend a lot of time being a criminal throughout your life. Yeah. Yeah. Having a criminal record is massively damaging and just limits, you know, especially for a young person, it, you know, limits your options and kind of career options massively. So if we can, if we can tackle that at its root and then prevent further criminal behavior, then that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's mega. One of the funniest things about it was all the Tory MPs that came out in opposition to the diversion schemes. You had this list of MPs who would say, we're against Sadiq Khan's diversion scheme, blah, blah, blah. Like, Even they've got diversion they've, schemes. They've got diversion <laughs> schemes in the constituencies. <laughs> like it's up and down the country. Like these schemes are completely normal, totally normal practice. But they should have probably stopped at Sadiq Khan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm opposed yeah. to Sadiq Khan. Because yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. That, that's, that's, yeah. that's exactly what it is. That's, but... that's what happens. Again, that comes back to my point around like engage politicians less because politicians make the issue about their issues. So if you, you know what I mean? It's, they, they, it's they political. Don't, yeah, they don't collaborate. It's all just political. They don't collaborate because they think, well, we can't say the same thing as them. So do you know what? Don't worry about them. Focus on the things that you can change. And again, again, the diversion schemes are a good example. Engage the police, engage third sector organisations, engage community groups, and you can see the implementation and acknowledgement of diversion schemes. You don't need politicians to run up and down the country slapping diversion schemes anywhere. You can just make them happen. And then in time, the normalisation of that as a process and the recognition, you know, the, just you get there. You can get there through pulling other other levers which is a, in many ways it's an unfortunate state of affairs but it is also a very realistic state of affairs yeah yeah no 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 absolutely and you know i'm conscious of time but we could have talked loads more as we sort of close it out i always like to sort of try and think of this in a slightly international context as well are there any other countries that you look to for inspiration around drug policy in particular not necessarily a cannabis industry but drug policy reform and, and do you engage with any agencies in those countries yes i run a a group called ECAN. It's the European Cannabis Advocacy Network. I've been running it since I started at Voltfast. It's it's a network of advocates and advocacy organizations across Europe that are all working towards cannabis liberalization and cannabis reform. We mention other drug policy sometimes, but it's it's mostly focused around cannabis and medical cannabis access. So that's been great because I think there's so much going on across Europe and everyone's working towards similar things, but not necessarily communicating with each other because we're all busy and wound up in <laughs> each other's messes with drug policy in our own countries. So it's really nice and kind of, yeah, it's a nice change of pace hearing about all the developments in those countries and just seeing the similarities and seeing how we can collaborate and work together. So yeah, we do like monthly meetings with all the members and yeah, we've got representation from almost every European country at this point, which is quite cool. <laughs> wow. It's like Eurovision. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eurovision but for cannabis. <laughs> well, you could pull in some Australians and some uh, Israelis, I think, as well. <laughs> and then you got it. Wow, that sounds brilliant. And guys, I'm really pleased that you guys could share the time today and would love to get you back on. When does this pilot scheme kick off? It's a good question. The, fact, good that question. It was, the fact that it was leaked was a problem for loads of reasons. One of them being that it obviously put the mayor in a difficult position was what do you think kind of this game yeah, blah, blah, blah. like put them on the back foot so we will have to see well time will tell what the fallout of that is you know when it can be implemented i'd like to think and i think the evidence is fairly strong that the reaction and the polling in the city suggests that it's not controversial and that the public are, are very supportive so we hope to get it out soon but as with anything when it's leaked it just creates quite complex conversations in terms of when release dates are are coming so we'll yeah we'll keep people posted but sooner rather than later yeah 
Well, it'll be good once it, is, once it has kicked off if, to get you guys back on to get your thoughts of how it's being implemented and, and, and any feedback we can get. But yeah, thank you again for sparing the time. It was a great chat and lots of interesting stuff you guys are doing. So I wish you all the best with that. Cheers, mate. You thank too. Thank you. Yeah, no, pleasure to come on. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. Please visit www.canverse.global to get in touch.